Hello, everyone. Welcome to the June Ivy Talk. We are excited to be hosting this one this evening. I'm Susie Farmer. I'm the Education Director at Ivy Creek Foundation, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all tonight. I would like to welcome uh, Miss Caroline Bertrand. She was recently introduced to birding and is happy to share tips to assist you in your journey to learn more about birds and how to identify them. Um, she's taken the PVCC bird class four times and remembers vividly standing in her yard hearing 10 different things and only being able to identify two of them. She wants to show folks that it's possible to learn and how easy it is. So before we get started tonight, just a few housekeeping items. Um, one, this is being recorded and it'll be posted to our website in the next few days. Um, two, please mute yourself if you have not done so. And finally, please put your questions in the chat box and we will answer them at the end of each segment. Um, now I will turn it over to Caroline. Thank you, Susie, and hello, everybody. So I'm very happy to uh, share this with you. And I want to be very clear that uh, my only claim to fame is that uh, I was recently a beginner. And so I feel like that makes me a good, um, a good person to, to tell you the things that have helped me. Uh, I would like to encourage all of you to chime in in the chat with has, things that have helped you as you think of it as you go along. And then we'll ask questions, we'll go with questions at the end of each, um, each section. So um, Bill Shaw is a local photographer that I met in the first bird class and all the photos that are not my little iPhone photos came from him. So um, I, I'm convinced that the newest convert is the biggest proselytizer. So that's why I'm so <laughs> eager to tell everybody about birds because I feel like it's changed my life. And so these are the things that I would like to talk to you all about today. Um, the people who ran this bird class are Dan Beaker and David White and who um, teach it at PVCC. And these are the topics that I would like to cover. I'm hoping that some of the strategies will help you. Uh, so what do you need to get started? Um, the only thing you really need is binoculars. And at the end, I'll have a link to some reviews that you can use if you would like. You need shoes that can get wet. You need insect repellent or to wear high boots uh, because we have ticks around here. Uh, you want a hat and sunscreen if you're out later in the day. And the, I, I tried birding at Ivy Creek when my children were little and I finally got out of the house and I went to some of the bird walks and I could not stand it. These people did not move. They were trying to look at a bird. I couldn't see anything and it was so boring and I just did not get it. And now I'm, I'm just completely obsessed. And so... Um, there's different reasons why it's really working for me now. One reason is it's like a game. Uh, so you're gonna go out and are you gonna see a bird? If it's a bird, are you gonna see enough to be able to identify it? If you, uh, if you see something that helps you identify it, can you figure out what it is? If you figure out what it is, is it what's called a good bird? As Susie was saying, I don't know if it's a good bird. We don't know because everybody's definition of a good bird is different. and. It changes as you learn more and a good bird is a bird that's a little more unusual for you, I guess. Um, my son is into game design and he said that psychologists have figured out that the most addictive reward in a video game is the random reward. Well, guess what nature provides? The random rewards. So the game side is very addictive. There is a meditation side to me to birding where you can be completely focused on what you're looking at and you forget everything else that's happening around you, especially if you are able to get up uh, very early for the dawn course right now it's 515 and it's really a magical time. Uh, you see the sunrise and that's all inspiring and you hear the birds and that's all inspiring and I feel like it's really, it makes my day go better when I start with birding. And then the third uh, part that makes me love birding is the knowledge part, because there's so much to learn and uh, so much to try to figure out. 
and it's really exciting to me. So I'm hoping I can communicate my enthusiasm to you all. All right. So what is it that you want to focus on when you first start out? It's not so much to worry about the identification, but on developing your observation skills. You want to look at the shape, the size, and the behavior. You want to look for patterns. In the spring right now, when you're going to see several birds together, it's likely to be a family, uh, unless it's birds that frequently stay as a group. But uh, like bluebirds right now, you're going to see a family. Are the slides moving correctly? for you, is it working? Okay, I want to show you uh, the first time I drew anything between the age six and my current age. And so as you can see, you do not need to know how to draw to use this technique. It's just a strategy that might work for some people. And I got it from John Muir Laws and he has lots of stuff on the internet about how to do this. So if you would like to uh, to create and use this strategy. The purpose of it is not to do something artistic, it's to help you sharpen your observation skills. Because when you have to draw it, you have to see it better. How is the beak exactly? You can see in this drawing, I changed my mind about the color of the beak. Uh, you can notice the behavior and wonder why. You can add text, you can write out your questions. Really, if you end your observation with a question, that is a really important step for learning, is starting to ask yourself some questions. So you can use this strategy. It, don't be afraid of your lack of artistic talent because it's not what it's about. It's about using it to, to see better. Um, another thing you can use is the Merlin Bird ID. Uh, and everybody needs the Merlin bird ID. And then you wanna choose the pack for the Southeast US. If you don't yet have it, it's a free app and you definitely want it. From there, um, you can explore birds. You, if you can see it here in the bottom, uh, you can see explore birds. And then uh, that's the list of all of the birds. One thing I would recommend you do when you use this app is to switch to the likely birds by family. That to me is really helpful in helping you narrow the quantity of birds you're going to look at. Uh, and the other thing that I really love about it is it shows you here, you can see this bar graph is by month of the year. So when I took this photo it was in September. And so you have this little line that's showing you when, where it is. Here, what you can see is if I was trying to look at birds in December, the only bird that would come in this category would be the great blue heron because it would be here in December. These other birds are not here in December. So I love that the app is already narrowing your list with the likely birds using the calendar. So it's using the calendar and it's also just using how common the bird is. So I highly recommend when you use Merlin and you're beginning, make it listed on the likely birds. So one thing I, um, I want to tell you is that all birders do some guessing. It's just that some birders have a lot more information than I do that they're guessing with. And so their guesses are a lot more likely than mine to be correct but everybody can use guesses. And here's an, an, a way that you could guess. If you're seeing a great blue heron in the winter, a great big bird in the winter, that's the only one in this category. See, so you could guess and you would be right. So, all right, then you have this other thing that this other feature in the Merlin bird ID, which is the bird ID. It will ask you questions to help you narrow your search. So it starts with the size. Does it look like a robin? And then it gives you a list of about a dozen birds from which you can decide which one looked more like your bird. Uh, one of the things you need to know is as you can see, there's a little button uh, here where you can listen to the bird. And I do not recommend you just listen to the bird in the field. My teacher was uh, feeling pretty strongly about that because the bird then hears another bird of the same species that, and that could be stressful, threatening to the bird. So when you wanna to listen to the audio in this beautiful Merlin Bird ID app, it'd be better if you can do it indoors. All right, so where should you go birding? The thing I would really recommend is 
uh, what's most convenient, your own backyard, whatever is closest to you. If there's a tree or a bush, there's a good chance you're going to see a bird. I don't know if you can see it because this is my iPhone photo, but you can see there is a bird on the chair. So <laughs> there's a bluebird on that chair. And John Young, the author of What the Robin Knows, uh, he recommends just using a sit spot. You sit in a spot every day for 20 or 30 minutes and you watch the same place, the same birds, and eventually you're going to learn the birds that are right next to you. And again, it's, it's sort of a meditation to just be there and sit and watch and listen the birds. Listen to the birds. All right. So in order to, what can you do to attract the birds to your own backyard? So you wanna provide food, water, and shelter. And I wanna show you some of the things that we've been doing with providing food. We've had a to fight with a squirrel. We've had to uh, argue with the hawk who thought we had a great bird feeder for hawks by offering this bird feeder. And we've had some conversations with another animal. I don't know if you can tell because this is my phone picture that it's a bear. So it's very fun feeding the birds. You don't know what kinds of adventures you're gonna get. Another way to feed the birds is to use your backyard. Uh, so there's a very, very big movement now to say that you know bird numbers are really declining and most of property in the US is in private hands. And so the way to really help the birds now is to convince homeowners to change their own yards to uh, plant natives. Um, basic, what's, what's really interesting is 80% uh, of the birds feed insects to their young. And so actually you want to encourage insects. That's not what you think about when you think about trying to feed the birds, but this is what would be most helpful. So food, water, shelter, cut back on the grass and use benign neglect. Leave the wood piles. The sparrows love the wood pile. Leave the old tree standing. The woodpeckers like the old tree. So that's, you know, that's gonna be another thing I wanna learn when I grow up is um, how to make my yard more bird friendly. Where else can you go birding? So anywhere that's easy to get to, uh, like the public parks and things like that. I'll show you a, a way you can find a list of good places to go birding. You want to look for places that have a good variety of habitat. You want to go early in the morning because early in the morning, the birds are hungry, are hungry. They're hopping around. They're looking for food. You want to look where the sun is shining. So when I go to Ivy Creek in the winter, I go to the South Field because the top of the trees will be lit up with the sun and that's where the bugs go and that's where the birds go. So how do you look? You want to look with a naked eye and you scan for motion and then you bring the binoculars for the eye. In that process, I lose my spot half the time. So what I've learned to do is when you see the motion in the tree with your naked eye, try to pick an identifying feature that's gonna help you remember. Is there a branch that goes like this? Is there a patch of blue sky that can help you find the spot you were looking at? A lot of times you'll see the bird land and then you don't see it anymore. It is worth your time to try to stay on the spot where the bird landed for a little while and see if the bird pops back up. A lot of the birds will move a lot around the spot and you have a good chance to see it if you wait for a while. Um, listen also, and that can help you find a bird. If after you've been in one place for five minutes, you see and hear nothing, you can just move on. Um, Another way to look is to look at the treetops. A lot of birds like to uh, sing from the treetops and survey their surroundings. Um, look at any place where you can see, any naked spot in the tree. Uh, if you are in the country, you wanna look at the distant trees, you might see a hawk or something like that there. Uh, if you're near the water, you want to scan the shore or near the shore. The ducks are more likely to be near the shore than they are in the middle of the water. All right, then I want to use, show you the eBird website. Uh, so unlike Merlin, this I do not recommend you use the app if you are a beginner unless you're birding with a kid 
because for the kid, it would be very motivating to use the app, but the eBird app is to post the birds that you are seeing. And when you're a beginner, you don't have a lot to post yet. So, but I do strongly recommend you use the website. So this is uh, one of the things you can see. You can you choose the explore button on the website and then explore regions and then I put Albemarle. So Albemarle has 157 hotspots and most of them are accessible to the public. And you can see Ivy Creek is number five on this list of hotspots based on the number of species. I think I have to move my thing so you can see here, based on the number of species that were seen. And as you can see, the bottom three are very close to each other, 180, 380, 180. So all it takes is one bird to have a lucky day and see an uncommon bird somewhere and then Ivy Creek can move up in the world. Uh, so it's a really good place for biodiversity and one of the best in the county. And I, I am absolutely convinced, though I have no uh, proof of it, that the top two, are, which are both in Crozet, um, are uh, surviving on old data. They, they get their top spot based on old data because old trail has been so developed. I mean, there's still a lot of birds, but I, I'm not convinced that today they would be the top places for biodiversity. All right, so another thing you can do is choose on the left, left side under explore, explore hotspots, and then you can see the map and you can see the hotspots that are closest to you. So a hotspot is a spot where there are a lot of birds to see that somebody um, has been using over and over again. So, here I'm going to tell you, since school is ending, I'm going to tell you the secret to uh, going birding is to check the checklist ahead of time. So here I looked at the checklist for Ivy Creek. So somebody went to Ivy Creek yesterday and they posted the list of all of the birds that they saw. So you can get the answers to the quiz you just don't know which answer goes with, with which question. So before you go to a hotspot, you can survey what does eBird say was there yesterday? And then you can go and you know what you're looking for. So this is an amazing feature that's really going to help you a lot. Um, another thing you can find in eBird is the abundance map. For example, with a tree swallow, this shows you um, the difference between the breeding and the non-breeding um location for the tree swallow so it's they're using the data that all the citizen scientists are providing to create this wealth of information it's just amazing and now they're adding the trends and you can see changes of a time over time yeah, so ebird is a just a phenomenal uh website and wealth of information all right, another way to bird. So I'm trying to give you all the different things you can use, right? You, you, can, you can draw, you can see, you can use Merlin, and you can also use for bir birding by ear, you can also use Merlin. They have now the sound ID feature. Um, and you can use this sound ID. One of the things I, I suggest is that you move the repeated live matches to the top. And I'm going to show you why in the next slide. On the right side, you can see here that um, Merlin's sound ID records what you're hearing and it tells you what it is. So it's just amazing. It's using at the top, it's using the visualization of the bird sounds. So as you can see on the left, I'm showing you what a spectrogram is and it's basically a visualization of kind of the same way as the music uh, is a visualization of the sound. And the artificial intelligence of the website is using the visual um, to compare the birds and identify the birds. So what I was saying earlier is uh, when I first started using the sound ID, I didn't realize that I could uh, move the repeated live matches to the top. And so I kept having to stop my recording and, and start again because I didn't know to do that. So now you know to do that. So this is just an amazing tool to use. Um, and I use it 
all the time now. And what I really recommend you do, if you're, if you're a complete beginner and you use the sound ID, it still will feel overwhelming. So what you can do if you are a complete beginner is just use sound ID at first to tell you what are the most common birds in your backyard. The most common birds close to you, pick two or three that are coming up all the time. For me, it's gonna be the Cardinal and the Carolina Wren. Then at a different time, when you go inside, you use the explore bird feature and you try to listen to what that sound makes. The, the Carolina Wren and the Cardinal, what's the most common song that the app is recommending? And try to start with that because bir the Merlin bird ID in the re as it records, as it listens, it recognizes the songs and also other sounds that you won't know when you first start out. So ask the Merlin Bird ID Explore feature to teach you the most common bird songs for two birds. Just start with two. Just practice two for a week. And the following week, when you listen to the Merlin Bird ID, try to recognize together with the, with the bird sound ID, which two birds you were looking at. All right, here's some other tools you can use. Larkwire is a game. Those you have to pay for, both of those. And Birding by Ear, this is a, C a set of CDs. They compare songs together. It has helped me a ton. Uh, I've liked that a lot. So if you would like to use it, I highly recommend it. And then when I took the class, these were three birds that um, were recommended to listen to. So I'm gonna show you those three. So. Uh, the robin, I'm going to go to listen, so you can listen to the robin. You can hear the song? Yeah, okay. So the song of the robin, you need to know that one because there are other birds that sound similar to the robin. And then you're gonna, as you learn more about birds, they're gonna say, oh, that one is the robin with a sore throat or, oh, that one is the robin that took voice lessons. So you do wanna learn the robin song because it's one you're going to use in the future. You also wanna learn the Carolina Wren mostly because it's just everywhere. And also because there are other birds that sound similar to that. And then you also want to learn the chipping sparrow. Again, other birds will be similar to that. So when you look at the spectrogram at the bottom from eBird, which of those three birds is that one? Okay, I guess people are on mute. So it's the chipping sparrow on this one. All right. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about birds you already know. Why do I do this? Uh, because the reasons I wanna do this is because I wanna give you confidence. Uh, like I said, the way that um, you learn is by guessing and by making mistakes. It's kind of like learning a language. You don't learn a language if you don't try. Um, so trust your instinct when you see a glimpse of a bird. And if even if you think you know absolutely nothing about birds, you will know those 10 birds. Another reason I wanna show those birds is so you can compare with other birds. As you saw in the uh, bird ID, they were comparing side by side. So what's the size of the bird? And the way people learn is by connecting to something you already know. So, hey, you already know 10 birds. And then another reason I'm doing this is because if we're gonna be guessing, the most common bird is gonna be the most likely. So I'm gonna start with this one. And this one, uh, I think everybody knows this one and let's listen to it. All right. Maybe. So 
So you all know this bird, it's the Northern Cardinal and it's got, it's um, this, this, it has actually 24 different songs. When I first took the class and I first took a walk, I heard, we heard the bird and the teacher says, this is the Cardinal. I said, okay, good. All right, now I know the Cardinal. We move on, different song. What's that? Oh, it's also Cardinal. <laughs> so it's not one bird, one song. Some, in some cases it is, but there are many, some birds that have more than one song. So the way to learn the Cardinal song is not, is to focus more on the sound quality. It's a very rich song and it goes very high up and very down low. Uh, and if you focus on that, I think eventually you're going to learn it. Uh, there's a lot of different patterns. One of them goes choo, 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 choo. and to me, it sounds like a jackhammer. I don't know if it will to you, but um, so the Northern Cardinal is called um, originally because the distinctive crest reminded American colonists of the ceremonial headdresses worn by European bishops and cardinals. So this is what it is. It's actually a really gorgeous bird. And the first, when my family comes from France and they see this, they are so thrilled to see this gorgeous red bird. But even the female looks, she looks really pretty. She's very, this warm brown color. So supposedly they mate for life. Uh, and I heard somebody say, well, about as, as well as humans do, and that helped me put things into perspective. Um, and, but there, I have read several anecdotes of people watching um, this, the, the birds, the cardinals putting themselves in danger to help save their mate. Like, you know, there's a hawk. The cardinals are always in touch by chipping for each other, chip, 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 chip. So if you hear a lot of chipping around you and you know there's lots of cardinals, there's a pretty good chance it is a cardinal. And so the story is the, one of the mates stopped chipping back. The cardinal sees there's a hawk coming and went in the way of the hawk to distract them and make it impossible for them to go catch the mate. So that's pretty beautiful story. All right, what is this bird? It's a mimic. It sings a lot of different songs. It likes to have its tail up a lot. And let's hear it. Listen. So that one's crazy. It fools me all the time, the a mockingbird does, because it imitates another bird. So I hear Phoebe, Phoebe, and I'm convinced it's the Phoebe. And then a second later, it moves on to singing something else. So this is very, very um, uh, tricky. What I read an interesting thing, I think it was on the Bird Club website, that said that uh, this bird was not an Alma County resident at the time of Thomas Jefferson. It followed the westward expansion and the clearing of the land. And that Jefferson claimed that it, its song was far superior to that of the Euro European nightingale. So that's a cute little story. All right, the robin. Uh, oh, I wasn't supposed to tell you, but you know this one. <laughs> and. Let's hear the song. Oh, no, we already heard the song. We don't need to hear the song because I played it for you as a bird you need to know. So it's one of the birds they use in the bird ID to help you identify it. And we have it all year long around here. Sometimes they land on your grass in a large group. Sometimes they're hiding in the woods. It's always the same robin. All right. This one is a bird that is only present in North America. Uh, the males and females look the same in the front, but the males are more brilliant blue. They like to sit in um, on a fence post, like you can see here. And let's hear the song. It's a mumbling. And once you learn it, you hear it all the time. 
so it was um um it has struggled with the competition with the house sparrows, which are not a native species. And, uh, but a lot of people have been putting up bluebird houses and that has helped them a ton. So, all right. And this one, you can't really see what the bird is, but I just love the picture. So this is a bald eagle and this is a crow. And what I love about it is that the crows are very frequently doing this. Uh, they chase, and actually all birds do it, but crows especially, they will chase um, uh, other birds away and they don't care about size. They'll just go and scare them off. The crows may be the smartest birds. They're also extremely social. They will mourn their dead. Um, so let's listen to the crow. You already know the crow and let's hear it. You know that one, you hear it all the time. Um, there was a story of a researcher who was doing banding of the babies in the nest and the uh, crows kept attacking him after that. They didn't forget. Uh, and every time he would walk to the research building from his car, they would go and attack him. They knew his face and their babies knew that he was a bad person that needed to be attacked. So that's an amazing story of how smart they were. And then after that, the researchers who were doing banding of crow babies in the nest uh, would wear a mask so they could walk to their cars in peace in the future after that, because they truly identified the individual by face. So there's another a crow that we have around here that's called the fish crow, which is why I put this little fish bowl here. And so let's hear the fish crow. It's nasal. So it's really hard to tell them apart by, um, by uh, sound, uh, other than by sound. It's really hard by sight, but you can tell them apart by sound. So this is the, a bird that you can recognize it better here on the left with the crest, but you can see the crest here is completely down. And uh, let's hear this bird. And it also does mimic other birds. Sometimes I'm convinced I hear a hawk and I run out of the house and it's only the blue jay making fun of me. All right, these are two birds that um, are similar uh, when you see them. Hold on, if I, you can't see my, here. this is good. All right, now you can see better. Uh, so you can see the differences. The turkey vulture has the white all along the wings. The black vulture only has the white at the end of the wings, uh, like it's wearing a way to wearing white gloves. The turkey has the red head, the black has the black head. The turkey has an amazing sense of smell, the black not so much. Um, so, and there are more differences you can use for identifying them in, in flight. Um, the turkey wobbles a little more, but I'm not very good at that yet. Uh, but you certainly see vultures all around. All right. So this one, uh, of course, you know this one, you see it all the time. And I just added it because we see it everywhere. And one little tidbit I thought I would share, uh, whether you want to hear it or not, is that uh, why is it that people complain about the geese so much is because they poop all the time. And why do they poop so much? It's because they eat grass, which is not very nutritious. So just wanted to tell you this little tidbit. So the great blue heron, um, I, I of course want to talk about the rookery that we have at Ivy Creek. It's amazing that they like to raise their babies together. They suffered a lot during the, from DDT. Uh, it made the shells uh, fragile and it was really bad for the bigger birds. And the population was really low in the 60s. And now it's the most abundant water bird in the Chesapeake Bay. So we really enjoy it the heron. 
All right, this is the most common bird on the continent and its name comes from its song. So let's hear the song. Oh, well, now you see what it is. <laughs> All right. So that's why it's the morning dove. It will have multiple broods with two eggs on a precarious spot on a branch. Oh, I have to move this so I can close my bird. Here we go. Uh, okay, I think I'm, um, I got lost in my sharing. Let me stop sharing here for a second. And slideshow, I'm gonna go to view. All right, share the screen. Okay, view. All right. Okay, so that was the morning dove. And no, it's not moving. All right, and what is this one? Um, most likely you have a feeder for that one also. And it's just an incredible bird. It's so tiny, it flies, it's the only bird that hovers. Um, it needs to eat every two hours, but somehow it can cross the Gulf of Mexico. It can cross 500 miles because it accumulates enough fat to try to do this crazy migration. So, so I wanted to show you those 10 birds to show you the, that you already know those birds and that you're just trying to add on to this existing knowledge and make connections with the things you already know. So now we're gonna go to some birds that you may or may not know. Like the, this one is the one on the right is the one I wanna talk about. It's the only bird that walks down on a tree trunk and it's the white-breasted nuthatch. It has a nasal song. Let me play it for you. Ah, this is such a great photo. Okay. So the photos are again Bill Shaw. All the good photos are Bill Shaw. Listen to the nut hatch. <laughs> All right. And here is. Uh, the other one, this is such an incredible photo of this dancer here. I love it. This is the bird that if you have a wreath uh, with a nest in it or a nest in your newspaper box, this is the bird. And it's the Carolina wren and it sings all the time and extremely loudly for its tiny size. So let's hear it. Oh, we already heard it earlier, but that's okay. We're here. All right, and this one is the Carolina chickadee. There are two chickadees around here, but the one you will see most of the time is the Carolina. So let's listen to that one. Okay, I'm gonna go to the sounds and I'm gonna show you why. If you, here I'm on this incredible website called All About Birds that has amazing information. And the chickadee name comes from its calls. Not that. That one, chickadee, dee, 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 dee. So there is a theory that uh, the chickadees are actually, I mean, it, it's being researched and proven that the chickadees are actually using a language and the numbers of Ds in the chickadee DD is communicating specific information about the predator that is coming, the size of the predator, what the chickadees should do. Should they try to mob the predator if it's not too big? Should they go away if it's a big predator? Is the predator coming from above or below? And they've done research that shows that all this is being communicated by the, chicka the number of Ds that the chickadee is saying. So 
we are learning things about bird language that uh, we didn't know. And one of the things that I've uh, I've read and that some people talk about is that probably our ancestors knew all of these things and they all had PhDs in birds and then, you know, because they needed it for their survival. If the chickadee is telling you where the predator is coming from, everybody needs to know and everybody's going to pay attention and learn. So that's an amazing thing that we're learning about bird language now. All right, this is the most adorable little bird. It's got the big round eye and that makes it really cute. And let's hear it. It's a tufted titmouse. And do you see that crest? And be careful, the crest is sometimes visible and sometimes not. It does that a lot. <laughs> it does also makes a lot of other sounds. So it's a common bird that you have in your backyard, but it will make other songs as well as a, other sounds, not songs. This it says it's only songs. Now we are on the house finch. Sorry, I went a little too quick. And here is the song of the house finch. That three at the end, that's very characteristic. Three. That's how I recognize it with this thing that at the end. So the male and the female look different. Uh, the male has more red. The female does, doesn't have um, the red. And there's a similar bird called purple finch that has a lot more red than the house finch. All right, this one, you have to see this photo. Look at that. This is the red belly woodpecker, and you will never see a photo as good as this one that really shows you the red belly. So, and because usually the belly is pressed against the tree and you don't actually see it. So let's hear that one. And this is a bird that gave me a lot of heartache. I have such a hard time with that bird. The male and the female look different. They both look different in the winter and in the summer and their song is very confusing. So what is that bird? Let's listen. There's a lot of variation in the bird in the song. All right, so we know this is the goldfinch. All right, what's the thing that's um, been happening is the migration. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Do you all want to pause? Uh, do you have questions or comments? Anything you want to put in the chat? There was one question. Okay. Um, Janet asked, it's my impression that the Carolina wren is much more common than it used to be. Is that actually true? Uh, that is a question to ask somebody who would actually know something. The only thing I know is how to get started learning about birds, but I do not know the answer to that question. So... We can Fair enough. It. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was interesting when we went to Wisconsin to visit our son, the Carolina wren is very rare there. And so uh, people were very excited when we talked about Carolina wren. And it's, it's, of course, it's not at all the same around here. I just feel like I'm hearing it all the time. Yes, I think you, that is true. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, I couldn't answer the question. So for this migration, what's um, really fun for birders is to, because the so many birds are coming in with the spring migration. So on the left, you have an indigo bunting, all blue and sings all summer long. And on the right, the scarlet tanager, which is also a gorgeous bird. So it's, birders get extremely excited about migration. And if you want to participate in bird club walks, they're gonna have a lot more of them during migration times. 
Caroline, there's another question. Yes. Um, on the Merlin app. Yeah. Where do you pick Southeast? Where do you pick? So when you download the, it's a bird pack. So on the menu, once you've downloaded the app, on the menu, it says bird pack and you will choose the Southeast. Yes, somebody is downloading Merlin. I've accomplished my goal. <laughs> All right. So this shows you uh, another incredible website that I want to show you that talks about migration, and it's uh, the BirdCast website. So it shows you a map of where migrations are, are, going, are expected to happen uh, So in the, all of the United States, and it shows you by county. There was one night where it was telling you that probably they're guessing 22 million birds crossed out my county. Like when I can't sleep at night and it's migration time, I check bird cast and I try to imagine all these birds going over my head. It's so fun. So they use uh, radar. They can tell what's a cloud and what's a bird and they cannot tell what birds it is, but guess who can? They're using eBird. eBird information is telling us which birds are most likely. So if you see on the bottom right here of this bird cast, it tells you expect a nocturnal migrants. The migrants, not all migrants migrate at night, but the songbirds do. Um, and the reasons for that is they're more safe from predators and they're, uh, it's cooler at night. So it's easier to stay cool and, and to travel. And how do they navigate and find their way? Um, they actually do follow, they know where North is. Uh, so they did an experiment with indigo buntings that were in a planetarium. And when they made all, this, uh, all the stars turn around a different star, and that was not the North Star, the birds followed that. So that's what they know. They can tell where North is by following the stars. It's just amazing. They're also using magnetic field. They're also using what they can see. Uh, and that's one reason why uh, lights are a really big problem for birds. They get, it gets them confused when they see city lights and there's a big movement now to ask big cities to turn off their lights on the biggest migration times because it's dangerous for the birds. All right, and just I just wanted to throw a couple of migrants in here. Uh, so the tree swallow, you see a lot at Ivy Creek. If you go to the fields, the north field, the south field, you'll see it there. And uh, this is my favorite song. You have to listen to it and admire it. It's the wood thrush. And uh, I I think I'm on the sounds, yes. So you can hear that one in the woods if you, at Ivy Creek, if you take, go towards the south field and you take, I can't remember if it's red or yellow, uh, or just go to the south field at the edge of the woods and then go into the woods a little bit, there's a very good chance you'll hear it. So, all right, and here's some tons of resources for you. I'm trying to get rid of this thing. Uh, so use the, the Bird Club website. Um, use all about birds, I showed you that. Of course, that Bird ID app, the Merlin Bird ID app, use eBirds. Uh, I have a link here for binoculars. The wildlife trail where it gives you places you can go birding. Uh, you can also use eBird to see all the hotspots and find places where you can go birding. Uh, so we talked about bird cast. In the fall, um, we have a great thing to go watch is the hawk watch at Afton Mountain. Uh, if you go to that dilapidated hotel that looks terrifying, you can go in that parking lot and there will be people watching for hawks and um, it's, you can learn. They have a day that they're inviting the public, but the public is welcome to go anytime. Uh, but they have an educational day um, and you can watch the hawks. 
I had this idea that, because you see huge numbers of hawks, I had this idea that you could see like a dark cloud of hawks going overhead, but it's not like that. They have these giant scopes and they're looking in the Shenandoah Valley and they see specks in their scope. And that's how they can have thousands and thousands of birds because they're seeing the whole Shenandoah Valley. So here I have art, an article about, but that you can see some hawks flying overhead. It's just not the thousands that they're counting every day uh, that are flying over your head. They're flying in the Shenandoah Valley. It's still a great thing and very worth your while. So an article about chickadee language, an article about nature journaling, um, more stuff you can use for learning bird songs. And uh, my email here at the bottom, feel free to email me if you have any questions about getting started with birding, not so much about birds themselves. Um, and if you get frustrated, please email me. I'd be happy to help you. And I go sit in your backyard and help you figure out what are the birds that are the most common birds. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share this presentation in the chat. I'm gonna stop sharing here and share it in the chat. So you can use this presentation uh, to use go to the links that I'm recommending in here. And if you're watching the recording, send me an email and I will send you the presentation. All right, thank you. Do you have any questions? Comments, the people who are already birding, what's working for you of all these strategies that I'm suggesting? Well, I learned what one of the birds was in my backyard from your- Oh, great. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I, I think for me using the Merlin bird ID by the location you're at, and it just sort of pops up the most likely birds you're gonna see there. Mm -hmm. it, it helps me uh, yes. narrow the list of possibilities. Yes. So the, it is true that sometimes Merlin can be wrong, sure. uh, but if it's popping yellow repeatedly, then it's probably correct. If you're close to the bird, if Merlin can hear it well, it's probably right. If, if Merlin heard it one time, it could be confusing with something else. And humans can be wrong too. I, I'm certainly wrong a lot. So <laughs> Merlin helps me a ton. Um, Tracy and Doug, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, we're running this through our TV now, so I'm not gonna turn the camera on, but... Um, so I think for, for me, spending time um, going outside and watching the birds and like Caroline, like you were saying, like learning one extra bird. I, I went down in May to, to help my dad in Texas for a couple weeks and I uh, so, Sound ID helped me identify a Mississippi kite. Oh, wow. And then I started seeing, they were all, there was a family in the neighborhood because and there was a horse barn which i think was helping feed them but just taking the time to do it even if it's only half hour a day or half hour every other day or something and even if you don't identify a bird if you if you're out in nature that's all good <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, if there's no more questions, Caroline, thank you for doing this presentation. You're welcome. This was so interesting and so informative, and uh, I learned a lot. And um, thank you all for spending time with us this evening. We hope that you have enjoyed it and learned a lot. Uh, we hope that if you have not visited Ivy Creek Natural Area and Historic Riverview Farm, that you will do so soon. We will have a couple of events coming up that may be of interest to you. Tomorrow at 6 p.m., we have a tree identification hike and still have a few spots left on that. I'm not sure, is there an echo for everybody? Let me mute and then unmute and see if that fixes it. Okay.
Um, so we have a tree identification hike tomorrow and a few spots left. On June 19th, we will be celebrating Juneteenth by having a guided tour of Historic Riverview Farm. If you do not know the history of Ivy Creek Natural Area, this is a great opportunity to learn about the family and the significance of the land. Um, on June 29th at 6 p.m., we will have a wildflower hike and learn all about the diversity of the flowers at Ivy Creek Natural Area. And finally, we will have another Ivy Talk on July 28th. This one will be presented by Mariah Payne, and it's called What It Means to Be a Descendant to Me. Mariah is our intern and has discovered that she is a descendant of Monticello and also a descendant of Emma Louise Hawkins, who was Texie Mae Hawkins Carr's sister, uh, and which is the family that uh, lived at Riverview Farm. We are excited to have her present. All of these events are free and open to the public, but we do ask that you pre-register through our website ivycreekfoundation.org. Um, so check those out. And if you enjoyed this talk and would like to support what Ivy Creek Foundation is doing for our community, please consider going to our website and becoming a donor today. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Thank you. And let's go watch the herons fly away very soon. <laughs>